Okay, I think we should get started. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us for the very last session of this workshop. It's been a lot of fun so far. And uh, I'd like to invite, uh, or I'd like to introduce Michael Lippman, who's a, a professor at Brown, and he has a lot of really amazing work in uh, seminal work in you know, reinforcement learning, especially partial observability, and a really broad, uh, a very large gamut of topics is published on from you know, game favor self-driving cars to the psychology of learning to deep learning. And I am excited to hear this talk, which I think is more closer to the seminal part of RL, but please take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can live up to that. I also was thinking uh, in the beginning, Akshay was saying that it was kind of uh, Microsoft New York Day. And I was gonna be like, yeah, me too. I was at Microsoft New York last summer. So I'm part of that crowd. And then I heard the talks from the Microsoft New York people and I thought, I don't wanna bring down their average. So just, if, if you like what I say, you can credit it to them, but you know, but mostly you can just say that this is, this is me. So um, uh, yeah, I kinda, I kinda was picturing this, the whole workshop is actually being a lot of you know, chatting and thinking about philosophy and stuff, but, but the talks have been amazing and, uh, and highly technical. And so this might not be quite as technical as some of them, but, um, but I thought it was nice and it and and it you know it connects with Chuba, so that's always a positive thing. So uh, this is an alternative softmax operator uh, for reinforcement learning. Uh, work primarily uh, carried out by my student Kavos, who actually defended his dissertation yesterday during this workshop. So I had to bug out uh, to to oversee that process, and he did great. And uh, he did this work and a bunch of other projects, um, also somewhat connected with Microsoft. But he ended up at Amazon of all places. And so we'll see how that uh, turns out in the long run. All right, so uh, we've talked a little bit about the, the kind of the reinforcement learning model, uh, Markov decision processes, states, actions, rewards, transitions, discount factors, et cetera. Uh, the goal of, a, of an agent trying to learn to maximize its uh, future expected discounted reward. And the fundamental quantities that we tend to talk about are things like the policy that maps states to actions, the value function uh, with respect to a policy, which says, if I start in this state and follow the policy, what's my future expected discounted reward going to be? The, uh, the action value function or the Q function, in this case with respect to a policy, which is the same thing, except uh, possibly, uh, or I'm gonna take uh, a specific action A first before embarking on policy pi, and, and of course the, the transition function. So um, what I want to get at is this notion that the, um, Let's see, it's not on the slide, which is good. All right, so here we, we have some notion of a policy. So what's the policy? Uh, what policy do you wanna take? You could just be like, I'm random, or you could be somehow guided by, for example, the values that you've been learning and representing. So uh, the typical thing that we do for, for the Bellman equation or for Q learning is that we're going to say, when I'm in a state uh, that has a set of actions, so looking on, on the left-hand side of the screen there, there's four different actions. They have different values associated with them. I'm gonna put all my money on whichever uh, action has the highest value. So I'm gonna take the max in the current state of all the actions I could take in that state. And that's, that's what I'm committing to. And so my value should come from that action and my behavior should be that action. And this is known as greedy action selection. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna be taking that op optimal action and we're not doing any kind of exploration or anything like that. Now, of course, if the Q values that you've got are not fully learned yet, taking that greedy action, that maximum value action, isn't necessarily a wise thing to do. You wanna maybe mix it up a little bit. And so what we have on the right-hand side of the screen, which of course Zoom isn't showing me, but hopefully you can see, um, is the notion that we have a set of actions with different values and we're gonna allocate our probability of taking an action in some way related to the values. Like maybe we'll take A3, which is the maximum action more with higher probability, but we'll also take the other actions with some probability as well. So we can find out more about how they work. So we're gonna take more, do more exploration. Uh, we're gonna take suboptimal actions or what we believe to be suboptimal actions some of the time, uh, which means we're exploiting less relative to our state of knowledge, but as we're learning over time, we're going to be uh, improving our understanding of the environment and, and hopefully getting more reward, having a better estimate of what those values actually are. So, all right, so <laughs> Kavos drew a little picture. This is Pac-Man in a grid. He's got a apple, which is a good thing. You wanna to try to get to the apple. And then he's got a COVID virus 
uh, in the middle, which is a bad thing. You don't want to bump into that. Uh, so keep your, you know, keep washing your hands and don't have your mouth open so wide. So uh, the, what, we're, what we're thinking about here is the idea of when we're in some state, like state seven, and there's the set of actions that we can take from state seven, how are we sort of aggregating those values into a single value to say how good it is to be in state seven? So we're mapping a vector over actions to a single scalar. And the, the Q-learning, Bellman equation, optimality sort of notion is that we're going to take uh, assign the value to be that maximum value over all the actions. But you could also take the mean, like if I'm behaving randomly, then my value for being in that state is going to be the average of, of the values of those actions. Or maybe I could be epsilon greedy, right? So epsilon greedy says that with some uh, large probability one minus epsilon, I'm going to take the maximum action and we're going to get that expected value. But with some small probability, uh, we're going to take the, the, the mean value over, over all the actions. All right, so those are, these are all sort of different ways that we can summarize a set of values. One thing that people have noticed and have used in practice is to say, well, I'd really, I don't, yeah, it's good to put a lot of weight on the maximum, but like, what about the second largest? Like, that would be a good thing to put some more probability on, mass on as well. And this epsilon greedy approach just says, okay, there's the, there's the max and then there's everybody else. So the Boltzmann weighting says what we're going to do is we're going to take the Q values, our, our value estimates of all the individual actions. We're going to multiply them by beta and take e to that power and, and call that a kind of a weight. Uh, we're going to get turn that weight into a probability by normalizing it by the sum over all the actions. And then we're going to weight each Q value uh, for, for each of the different actions that we consider taking. We're going to weight it by that probability. And in fact, we could behave according to that probability as well. So we're going to more often take high valued actions and less often take lower valued actions. And this parameter beta kind of lets us control how much we're going to be acting randomly and just exploring and how much we're going to be maximizing, how much we're going to amplify the, the uh, probability that we put on the highest value Q value. So these are all things that people do. I guess mean is not really something that people do when they build uh, like Q learning algorithms, but um, but the other ones, you know, epsilon greedy is very popular. You see it in current papers. Boltzmann exploration is very popular as well. So uh, back in the day, uh, Chuba and I said, well, if we have all these different ways of summarizing values, can we take the standard Bellman equation, which is what's on the screen now, and and modify it to reflect these other ways of aggregating values together. So we can replace the max with like a generalized x with a circle around it, a generalized operator that uh, is meant to stand in here for some method for summarizing a set of values. And we could, if we do that, then we can have a kind of a generalized value iteration algorithm or a generalized Q learning algorithm that says we're going to update our values not according to uh, the reward plus the discounted expected value of the next state, but uh, where, well, it is still that, but the value of that next state is going to be taken with respect to this operator as opposed to uh, just pure maximization. So we're going to include lots of other sorts of things in this sort of, in this one equation, in this one generalized algorithm. And what we showed in that older work is that as long as that summary operator, as long as that X with a circle around it, satisfies this kind of Lipschitz property, uh, things are going to be OK. So we call it the non-expansion property. And the non-expansion property says that when we summarize the values between two different possible sets of values, right? so we've got a set of values, another set of values, we're going to summarize each of those sets of values and compare the result. We want it to be the case that that is no larger than the largest difference between those two sets of values at any position, any given action position, right? So, so uh, there's the difference between the first action values, there's the difference between the second action values, the third action values, the fourth action values. That needs to be an upper bound on the, the difference between the summaries of those two, right? If that holds, if we have that property for our X operator, then we can use it in the context of value iteration and everything works fine. So, that, uh, so then now <laughs> that leaves us with a new problem, which is, if we want to show that a, a, a particular way of defining values, a particular way of choosing actions, as it were, uh, by values, has this property, then we get that uh, there's a unique, fi unique fixed point. We can use generalized value iteration to find it. 
we can uh, get we get convergence in something like Q learning. So it's it's all good stuff. But now we actually have to prove that different operators have this property. So, you know, naturally this wouldn't be super interesting if Max didn't have this property, but it but it does. Um, that the value that we get, that is the difference between the max values of two sets of values here, I've got a set of blue values and a set of black values is upper bound or yeah, it's bounded above by the largest component wise difference of any of the, the, the given actions. So we have that property. That means we can put max in there. We've known this, everybody, people have known this since the forties. So that's, there's no big revelation uh, with respect to that, but it's nice that it kind of plugs in Lego style to this, this, uh, this more generalized algorithm. Mean does as well. It's easy to show that the mean holds, has this property. Um, I think it's neat. Nobody seems to find it useful, but the median also has this property, which I think is very, very cool. So um, many statistics that start with M can be used in the context of this particular algorithm. Midpoint is another one. In fact, the, the, a convex combination of any of these things of which the you know, midpoint is the, is the average of the max and the min. Oh, the min also has this. Uh, Minimax also starts with M and also has this property. Uh, in fact, that was the reason that we that we tried to prove it in the first place is that we were trying to show that uh, a certain kind of game theoretic version of Q learning would converge. But once we had it, we had this sort of general tool and lots of things could be used in this context. And so I was interested in, okay, what about the Boltzmann operator? Well, the Boltzmann operator turns out not to have this property. And at least at the time of my dissertation, um, that's all I knew. I knew it didn't have this property, but I didn't know that it wouldn't converge. Like I didn't know whether or not it would converge. There are some algorithms, some operators we can plug in here that converge in spite of the fact that they don't satisfy this property. Uh, and I didn't know about Boltzmann. And I said this in, in, my, in my RL class a couple of years ago and Kavosh was one of the students in the class. He's like, oh, well, you could use this other operator. And he wrote down an operator. I'm like, that's interesting. It turns out to be pretty closely related to some other things that people have used in the past. But it's, um, it's Boltzmann-like. So, so let me just kind of talk through this equation. We're taking the Q values. We're weighting them by omega here, very similar to the, uh, to the Boltzmann case. We're taking E to that, just like the Boltzmann case. We're summing that over all the action, just like the Boltzmann case. But generally, in the Boltzmann case at this point, we would then weight that by the Q value and then normalize. But we're, what we're going to do instead is average it, one over number, number of actions, uh, and then take the log of that value and divide by omega. So it wasn't obvious to me that this was even a sensible thing to do. It might be more mathy people might uh, instantly see, oh yeah, of course, that's the whatever per, per Schmidt average or something. But, um, but you know, to me, I'm like, I don't even think that makes any sense. So we went about trying to prove some properties of it. And it turned out that, um, yeah, it actually acts a lot like Boltzmann in a lot of ways. But it is, but it has some some significant differences. So here's some things that you can notice when you when you play with this. If uh, we've got a set of values one, two, three, four, and we apply this, <laughs> Kavosh calls it mellow max. It's like a mellow. It's like max, but it's more mellow. I don't know. So he, I told him that was a terrible name, but he really became very attached to it. So mellow max, you know, mellow, um, has this parameter omega. If we summarize the values one, two, three, four, as that value omega goes to infinity, what you get out in the case of one, two, three, four is four. As that value omega uh, goes to zero, then we get the average of one, two, three, four, which is two and a half. And for values in between, values of omega in between, we get this kind of soft interpolation between the mean on one side and the and the max on the other side. And in fact, that that really holds in general, not just for one, two, three, four, but any any vector of values that we've got. As this parameter omega goes to infinity, it becomes the max operator. And as this omega gets cranked down to zero, it becomes mean. And if you just keep cranking it back and go to negative infinity, it becomes min. So it's sort of, you know, ev everything you could possibly want. It's the Swiss army knife of, uh, of averagers. So uh, this contraction, so it has this contract, it has ultimately the operator, the bolts, the, uh, the Bellman operator with respect to this, this way of summarizing values has the contraction property, which means as we apply that operator to values, to vectors of values, the summaries are getting closer and closer to each other. Um, and that means that there is some value in the space, which in this case is marked by the red rectangle, that everybody is going to go to. Any value vector that we start with, if we keep applying this operation, it's going to get closer and closer and closer. It's going to converge to that fixed point. 
So, um, so the properties that we have of this, this Mellomax operator is that it is a non-expansion. Unlike the, the Boltzmann case, uh, the Boltzmann averager, uh, we have this non-expansion property. It acts like Boltzmann, but it's actually sort of friendlier. It's unlike the epsilon greedy, it's differentiable. Like I said, the, in, in the limit, as you play with this beta parameter, it, it can be max, min, or mean. Um, you can extract the, a policy from it, right? So even though it's just a way of summarizing values, you can use that to assign probabilities to the actions that would achieve that value. The, uh, the maximum entries, entropy such policy has the Boltzmann form, which is neat, but you don't get to pick the Boltzmann parameter. It's gonna pick that parameter so that it has the, the you know, this property, so that it summarizes to this particular value. All right, and so we can plug it into generalized value iteration and we get an algorithm. And so we've been playing with this algorithm. I should probably be keeping track of time. That would be smart. But of course- I can give you a five minute warning if that helps. All right, where, where are we in time right now? You have 13 minutes left. Okay, thank you. I should get more computer screens. I think that would be a beneficial thing or just a clock, a clock would be good. All right, so here's a, here's a particular MDP, a really simple MDP. Uh, basically one state, two actions, action uh, A0, action A1. If you take action A0, you get a reward of 0.12. And with two thirds probability, essentially it, it goes back to S0. And with one third probability, it advances to a terminal state with no more reward. Action A1 has a much smaller reward, just 0.03, but a 99% probability of bringing you back to where you started. All right. So... Right, so more chances to get value, but kind of less value. So this is a, a really simple MDP. And what's, what's nice about the simplicity, the, the, the smallness of it, is that it's really, the, the Q values are really just, or the Q function is just two numbers. And so we can represent it as a, as a value in the plane. So we can ask the question of given a starting Q function, which again, is just a point like how much uh, what's the Q value for action A0? What's the Q value for action A1? We can plot that on a graph and say, if we apply the Bellman update with this particular summary operator being, uh, well, in one case, Boltzmann, in the other case, Mellomax, um, where does it move the value function to, right? It's this, the Bellman operator is a, is, a, is a mapping on value function. So it's going to take our, our point and it's going to move it to another point in the space. When we, when we apply uh, a Boltzmann operator with some particular value of beta setting to it, the value functions kind of move around in, a, in what turns out to be a very awkward way. So there's this dividing line marked in gray here where everything to the left of that dividing line, the, the value functions will move eventually to a fixed point, but everything to the, to the right of that gray line, it will also move to a fixed point, but it's a different fixed point. So we don't get a unique solution to the Bellman equation in this case. And partly for that reason, it, it, it tends to converge really, really slowly. So it just, it just acts awkwardly, it acts badly. Uh, Mellomax, on the other hand, we can pick some value of its parameter and we get this sort of nice vector field that's all going to, uh, to a fixed point. So single fixed point, and it gets there relatively rapidly. In fact, we can actually do that calculation. We can say for, for each of the possible settings of the beta parameter in the Boltzmann, uh, in the Boltzmann using the, in the Boltzmann operator, uh, how many iterations does this take before it actually converges to a fixed point? And for really small values of beta, it's actually quite fast. The, the black line on the graph here is what you'd get if you just applied the standard value iteration operation, value iteration uh, solution to it. We're just gonna iterate the, with the max operator and see how long it takes to converge to within some epsilon of, of uh, the fixed point. That's, that's the black line. The blue line is saying it actually converges even faster than the max operator for small values of beta and maybe a little bit for big values of beta, but there's an in-between value of beta where it starts to actually explode and, and convergence just takes a really, really long time. The values are just barely moving at all, sort of undecided as to which fixed point it's going to go to. Whereas the Mellomax operator, regardless of how we set the omega parameter, we're always getting something that is, uh, it's always converging. It's always converging relatively quickly. It's pretty close to what we get in the, in the max case. That's on that particular MDP that I just showed you. If I generate random MDPs and I ask, how long does it take for value iteration to converge? 
uh, we find for the Boltzmann operator are, you know, eight of the 200 random MDPs, it didn't terminate. It just, it just ran until we ran, until we got bored of running it. Um, and in three of those cases, it actually identified multiple different fixed points. Um, the average iterations was larger than what we got from LMAX, uh, which never failed to terminate and never found more than one fixed point because we proved that in fact, that that's the case. Um, and the experiments back that up. Uh, so what we're seeing here is an operator that is acting a lot like Boltzmann, except for in this very important way that it's much more stable, it's much more reliable, you can use it in, in a productive way. I think I had some more graphs on the side there, which I can't see, so I'm not going to talk about them. But I think, uh, I think they come from, <laughs> what do they say? If I can get it, I'll pop out for a second and look. Uh, Mean return, max entropy mellow, epsilon greedy. Yeah, we ran on some other MDP. Some, I think it was um, lunar lander or something like that. And, and we got uh, slightly better performance from mellow max when we set the, the omega parameter just so. But we got very good performance over a wide range of values, actually both for Boltzmann and for max entropy, but not so much for epsilon greedy, which is kind of a terrible way of doing exploration, even though people seem to do it all the time. People there's a, people. Yeah. Sorry, there was one question uh, oh, about that please. slide. Yeah. And the question is if the fixed points from Melomax relate to the fixed points from Boltzmann in some way, some characterizable way. Uh, well, yes, it's going to be the. So, okay, first of all, Boltzmann, we don't know that it has a fixed point. I guess it could orbit potentially. I don't think we've ever seen that case. I, we it probably always has at least one fixed point, but sometimes it has two. So that those two may relate to the Melomax thing. The, the thing is that they have very different parameters. Boltzmann has this beta parameter. Uh, Melomax has an omega parameter. The fixed point that we get from Melomax is always derivable by finding the appropriate value of beta for Boltzmann, and then it becomes the fixed point of that operator. So we always get um, the Melomax for every value of omega creates a Boltzmann with some value of beta that, um, that is going to be well behaved. Because Boltzmann's not always terrible. It's just, and you can see it on, the, on this graph on this slide too. It's just that there's, the, there's this sort of scary range and you don't know a priori whether or not you're in it. And uh, Melomax sort of interestingly like, keeps you out of that zone. It ends up picking a Boltzmann, a Boltzmann val value for beta that's, that's not <laughs> in that bad space. So since this was acting very nicely on the little tiny MDPs that we were playing with, we decided uh, you know everything's deep these days. So we'll try uh, deep Q learning with with this Melomax operator, in particular to try to understand the role of this this summary operator. This this would normally be Max, and how it interacts with a really important part of the deep Q learning algorithm, which is called the target network. So when you're when you implement deep Q learning, what you discover is that if you have just one representation of your Q function and then do updates on it as you're actually learning from the environment, you can get into these bad sort of catastrophic forgetting situations where the update that you make with the current data point actually causes it to unlearn something that it knew before. And then when you update with another data point, it, things start to fall apart, keep updating, and then you get, you know, it just things, things completely don't work at all. So one of the uh, one of the great insights that the the I guess now DeepMind team though I think they they were pre DeepMind when they had it no they were DeepMind but they were not Google DeepMind um, was this notion of well here's what we're going to do to stabilize the use of function approximation in in model free reinforcement learning we're going to freeze a, a representation of the value function and then do a bunch of updates with respect to that frozen uh, value function. Uh, until we're pretty confident that we have stable values across enough of the state space, then we do a step of learning and update the, the value function that way. So that, that frozen network is the, is the target network. And it's really awkward to have that because now you've got basically two copies of the value function that you're training kind of simultaneously and it's, it, it complicates the algorithm. It makes it more expensive to run. So it'd be great if you could get rid of that. And so we said, well, okay, well, maybe we can get rid of it by actually replacing the max in Q learning with mellow max, because maybe part of the problem here is that the max operator is actually accentuating some bad estimated values and causing things to spiral out of control. So if we just 
you know, ask it to be a little more mellow, you know, smooth it out a little bit, then maybe we've taken away that, um, that positive feedback loop that's, that's killing us. And in fact, that's, that's basically what we found, at least in a bunch of the uh, like Atari testbed games that, that people have been using for testing these algorithms, that uh, the, the red line here, generalized DQN with the Mellomax operator was actually getting higher returns, sort of better learning curves across a set of games, including uh, this, the submarine game and the, this Pong-ish kind of game breakout um, that was doing better than DQN with the target network and much better, certainly in the case of the, of the submarine game, than DQN if we took the target network away. So it really is this, that, that DQN with no target network, and that's the purplish or bluish line, and generalized DQN with Mellomax are the same algorithm, except we're just, we just took the max out and we're using the, the Mellomax operator instead. And we get this huge increase in stability, which results in much higher return in the environment. Uh, after we published this work, another group took a, took a really close look at what the Mellomax operator was doing and the connection to the Boltzmann operator and, and maximum entropy perspective. And they showed that another way of thinking about this is what we're doing is finding the policy that is regularized with, it's, en it's an entropy regularized version of the, of the greedy policy. So it's, it's trying to uh, essentially maximize the, the value while at the same time including an, an entropy term. And so we get this, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is maximize the sum of the expected value of the, of the Qs, you know, find the policy that maximizes that subject to this constraint, this, this extra bit of regularization that says, well, you can't also, like, don't be too maxi, right? Don't be too sp spiky as a distribution, try to be more mellow than that. What they showed is that in fact, it's doing the same thing, that the Mellomax operator by summarizing the values in that way, it's solving this, this, uh, this particular problem of, uh, uh, entropy regularizing the, the max operator. So I thought that was sort of cute and worth mentioning. All right, so that was, that was the whole story that I wanted to talk about, that uh, this Mellomax provides an alternative to Boltzmann exploration or epsilon greedy with better convergence guarantees, rich value dependent exploration like Boltzmann has, um, and just sort of some useful smoothness properties that, that, um, that seem to make things uh, conditionally uh, much more stable in general. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Really great talk. Um, I think there was one question um, from uh, Ranchi. Actually, now there are two, but I'll just read the first one. Uh, Ranchi asks if the mapping from Mellomax to Boltzmann is unique, given that the Boltzmann have multiple optima and uh, Mellomax does not. If the mapping for, so so when we when we want to find, all right. So so the way that we get Boltzmann from Mellomax is we say okay, Mellomax summarizes. We give it a vector of numbers, and it summarizes those and gets a particular value. There is a non-unique mapping of uh, probabilities to those values that that such that the expected value with respect to those probabilities will give us that value. But what we're saying is take of all those distributions that you could possibly be interested in take the one that maximizes the entropy. If you do that, then you get the value, you know, you're still getting that value out, that target value out like you're supposed to, but of all the distributions that have that property, we're taking the maximum entropy one, that has the Boltzmann form. Is there a unique Boltzmann form for each of those? In most cases, yes, but I don't, I guess I don't know if it's, if it's across the board. It could be like, like if all the values were zero, it's it's definitely the case that we should get we sh there should be multiple values of beta that would produce that same answer so it's probably not unique but i don't know if there's something stronger to say than that okay interesting and i guess one more quick question from the chats uh from Huya who asks uh, why the why using a higher temperature for the boltzmann doesn't solve the spikiness problem of the boltzmann operator well, if you use a high enough beta with the Boltzmann, it becomes like maximizing and then everything is cool. Yeah, that's true. You, you kind of lose the benefit of using Boltzmann. You might as well just use max. So it, it, I think, you know, we're, our hope is that you get, you, you're trying to get both, right? You're trying to get something that's well-behaved and relatively stable, but also spreads the wealth a little bit so that we get some reasonable exploration. All right. 
Um, higher temperature means the lower beta. Um, oh, okay. Sorry, right, sorry. Right. Uh, well, sure. I mean, that works too. <laughs> you can always make it very stable by by going the other direction and turning it into mean. So because mean, then you're right. basically saying, I'm estimating the value of, a, of an agent that is just blind and random. And that is extremely stable, but is not very, I don't know, aggressively optimizing. Right. That makes sense. Great. Well, I guess we'll maybe have more questions for discussion, but uh, let's thank Michael again. Great talk.